Great. So the archive has started. And welcome, Bagman. I think John will get you up to speed. He's type, typing some comments for you in the bottom left hand of your screen in the text chat area. So he'll make sure that you have any of the handouts that you might need for the workshop today. And for the rest of us, we'll continue. So what you'll walk away with today. Um, the point of today's workshop is to offer you a few proven methods for effective note-taking and some of the practices that are out there, as well as skills to consider to make the most of your learning during your lectures. And then we'd also like to give you some more resources for you to take with you in case you want to um, look into this even further. With the polls today, another thing I wanted to highlight is just that we are all students, including the facilitators tonight, and it's really my belief that we can learn as much from each other as the facilitator or the workshop presenter. So I'd really encourage you throughout the workshop to contribute in any of your comments or feedback or ideas that you have in that text chat area at the bottom. Please don't feel like you're interrupting the presentation by doing that. And John is supporting me by responding to those as well. And I'll do my best to make sure I take note of what you're saying and make sure I highlight it to the group. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me as I multitask with that. and. Um, Hopefully, we'll get to your questions in a timely way, but just feel free to fire anything in there at any time if you have questions or contributions to make. So for, for starters, I would like to come from a, a place of self-assessment for you to think about your current note-taking methods and what your practices are. Maybe you're really intentional about them, or maybe you just go in and wing it depending on the class and, and haven't really given it that thought. But I'd like you to just reflect on that now. Think about your current strategies and whether these are or maybe aren't working for you really well and share some of that with the group. So this is going to be another poll slide. If you just share with us what you're currently doing and if you feel it's really working well for you or not, you can type again right into that white box on the slide and then click Submit when you're done. It looks like we've lost Bagman, but we have Maria joining us. So welcome, Maria. I hope that you can hear me. If you can hear me, all right, you can always um, respond by typing something into the text chat box at the very bottom of your screen, where it says to and then main. There's a white box at the bottom. So if you can hear me, all right, you could just type a little greeting into the bottom and then hit enter. And again, for everyone, if you want to share your note-taking strategies and click submit when you're done, then we'll share where everyone's at with the group. Wow, welcome, Maria, all the way from Japan. Very cool. Welcome to the workshop tonight. We're starting off by just reflecting on our current note-taking strategies and if we feel like these are working well for us or not. So you can respond by typing directly into the white box that's up on the blue slide right now, and then click the Submit button when you're done. And if need be, John, we can send the links later in the workshop again, right when we need them, if it's too much for people to do it right now and participate in the poll. So I've got three people who've already responded to the poll, and um, I think I'll publish it because I'm not sure whether Bagman is able to participate or not right now. I see that he's joined us again, but he's maybe having some connection difficulties. So I'm going to publish what we've got just to see where people are at. So some of us take notes by hand and feel like you're really late to catch up in the lecture. Some of us write down more questions than the actual content. <laughs> Someone's admitting that they take too many notes. And I think that's really common. I, I would say that's probably my past habits as well, is that I tended to write down maybe more than I needed to in an effort to just get everything that the prof was saying down.
So thank you for sharing with us where you're at for now. And throughout the workshop, I'll remind you that, of course, everyone's different. So some of the strategies we might present tonight might work for you, or maybe they're not a good fit. So there's not one great answer for everyone, but hopefully we can get some strategies from each other and from the content that are worth trying and that might put us in good stead for the future. So the first one I'm going to present is something that's called the Cornell Method. You may have heard of it before. It's um, actually a highly researched method and a lot of academics think it's one of the best ways to take notes. Basically, it just involves setting up like an L shape on your page. That's the basic template for it. So that there's a margin on the left for you to just write in the key concepts or terms or major ideas or maybe questions like some of you talked about in your note-taking strategy. Not taking everything there, but that's where the key questions go. The center part is where you write down everything like you normally would. And then the bottom is where you take the time to do that summarizing that someone mentioned was really difficult to do when you're writing down absolutely everything. It can be really onerous to do that. So this is a way to set up your notes with a template that allows for you to do that right from the start. And I think maybe the, one of the most important questions throughout is to really ask yourself, why am I doing this strategy? Have I given it some thought? Have I, I thought about why it might work for me and what my method should be? Um, reasons why people think you should use the Cornell method is just because it's like a do it right in the first place system. It encourages that organization from the start and it forces that summary and review to happen at the bottom of your page throughout the term. Because I think it's really common for us to leave that till really late in the game and pile up a huge amount of content and get into a situation where we're having to summarize way too much in those final stressful weeks or maybe days before the exam. So this is, this is a tried and true method to try and get you into a habit and a pattern where you're not doing that to yourself. So we're actually going to practice it tonight. So this is basically what the template will look like. And I'm going to leave it up to you tonight. I did send out a template as one of the links, and I've noticed John has highlighted it again. There's a link in the bottom left text chat area. So that's your template if you really prefer to type things on the computer, or if you have that pen and paper handy and you're just going to do it by hand while I'm speaking, you can do it that way as well. Again, pick the style that works for you, and maybe or maybe try a new one and decide that uh, you just want to try something out for tonight. So we're going to have a little mini lecture on strategies for learning from our lectures. And I want you to try the Cornell method and then give some feedback of how you feel about this method and whether you think it's something you could adopt or that would give you some success. So here comes the mini lecture. And it's basically just about learning to listen. And in this case, the listen is going to, sta is going to be a, an acronym that stands for a few things. And the first step, obviously, for meaningful notes is to actively engage during your lecture time. A lot of us have three or more hours of lecture per course each week. So if you have five courses, if you're an undergrad student who's joined us and you have a full load, that's 15 hours of lecture time each week. And I know it was a habit of mine to maybe be diligent and attend all those lectures, but I would go just write down everything the prof said, sometimes till you feel like your hand's going to fall off, there's so much content, and then leave it. And really the learning that could have been happening during those 15 hours of lecture time wasn't happening because I was so focused on just copying everything down because I didn't want to miss everything. And I think that's a really common pattern. And the other part of that is I would just shelve all that information and then wait till right before the exam to start reviewing and get into a cramming situation because I really hadn't started that summarizing and um, really thinking through the key questions and concepts throughout the term and making the most of that lecture time. So the problem there is that I spent all that time writing instead of really focusing on the listening part and the understanding part. So we need to transition to that model where the learning takes place during the lecture. And the first step to that, the L for listen, stands for the lead-in. Some of this might be kind of obvious. Of course, you want to 
look at that syllabus, look at your course outline. But I don't know how many of us continue to do that throughout the term so that if we're given that schedule of lectures, did we look at what the theme or the key concepts are that are going to be presented that day? And did we do the assigned reading or not? Some of us have courses where the, the reading is just completely unmanageable, and maybe it really is difficult to do it all. But have you at least looked at maybe the chapter summary or the headings in the textbook, or at least the abstract and conclusion in the article? So when you come into that lecture, you're in a headspace where you're already engaged with the content. You're already thinking about those questions and ideas, and that might influence the kind of notes that you're taking. So that's what the lead part of LISTEN stands for. The other thing that um, people have highlighted is that arriving early to get the right seat can even make a difference. And I hadn't really considered that before, but I suppose especially if you're in lecture sizes with huge numbers, some of, some of the science lecture halls are hundreds and hundreds of people, if you're in a place where you're near the front and you have an opportunity maybe to interrupt the lecture and ask a question when you're stuck on something, or to be in a place where you're maybe less distracted by everything else that's going on, that can also make a difference. So it's something to consider. And the next part of the listen idea is just that. It's about the ideas. And I think this is the tough part. This is the thinking part. It's where we need to get away from writing down verbatim everything in the lecture and focus on processing that content while you're there. And I think when the material in a lecture becomes more difficult and more complex, that's harder to do. We just want to write it all down because we don't really understand it. And maybe we'll be able to figure it out later. And it's important to stop yourself there to ask questions or at least leave a gap in your notes so that at the end of the lecture you can maybe consult a TA or the prof or even just a peer in your class to make sure you're clarifying that content but that you're really focused throughout the lecture on those main ideas and not just on madly getting the content down. So as I'm talking today, I'm hoping that you're practicing that Cornell method on one of your templates or on a scrap piece of paper just to see how that's working for you. So the next part of the listen idea is S that stands for summarizing. And this is probably one of the really important parts and the parts that's really easy to maybe start off with with good intentions and let go of. But there's also a lot of research that supports the idea that summarizing your lecture notes within 24 hours of being in that class makes a significant difference to your retention level and comprehension of it. Um, some studies even state, state that you'll retain less than 20% of the material you learned in class unless you review and summarize it within 24 hours. And I know that's not a habit that I was very good at be, do, um, getting into consistently. So it's something that we almost have to schedule in. We have to decide, okay, I'm going to stay in the lecture at the very end and summarize all of the notes that I just took during that lecture right now. I'm going to take 10 minutes right after the lecture to do it now to make sure it happens. Or if you're someone who's rushing off to the next class and you don't have that luxury, can you do it at the end of each day and, and do that for each of your lectures? Is that something you can learn to schedule in? Because that might make the difference for you. And here again, this is where that Cornell, Cornell template really sets you, sets you up for that. There's that space right at the bottom to allow you to do that, and that space right on the left-hand side to ask those key questions. If there's trouble areas, or if there's ideas that you know you, you're properly emphasized or that you're going to have to come back to. So the T in the LISTEN acronym stands for TALK. And this can be another hard one if you're in a major lecture hall or, or if maybe you're a first-year student and it's a big transition from a high school setting with a small class size to a big intimidating lecture. But it can be really important not just to ask questions to clarify things when you don't understand, but having that discussion also forces you to consolidate your learning and to fix those ideas in your memory. So speaking up and, and getting those clarifications is really important. And if you feel like you can't do that during the lecture time, maybe, maybe you're just not that person, you're too shy, or maybe your prof just 
won't acknowledge you because it's such a huge class and you never see your hand up, then even starting a study group or connecting with a peer in your class so you can discuss the content at another time might be a really important thing to do. I'm going to highlight the resource later, but the Learning Commons at UBC is a, a great resource for finding out um, how to go about setting up a study group or even connecting with someone. There's online tutoring. There's even suggestions for the best ways to approach a prof or TA. Um, so if that's a, a resource you really need to get some information on to give you the confidence to, to approach those people or to set something like that up, I will highlight that resource later on. And the E in listen is for the ending, to encourage you not to rush out of that lecture hall, but to follow up in those last five minutes, either by clarifying questions or taking that time to do the summary at the bottom of your Cornell notes, or identify problem areas, or ask someone beside you if you missed something that you didn't quite understand, and they might be able to fill you in. So that's for how you end that lecture. If you have the lecture and you're not running across campus to, to your next class, maybe consider taking that 10 minutes, skip the latte between classes, and um, make sure you're doing that summary. And then the end and listen is, of course, the focus of the workshop today, is the notes. And the only thing I really wanted to point out here is, again, to try and get out of the habit of writing everything down and just stick to the essential points but also to learn to listen for signal words and to learn to get to know your prof style. So maybe you'll notice that they repeat certain things or there are certain definitions that they write up. Those are indicators that that's content you want to get down. Or if there's numbered lists or definitions, um, sorry, definitions I mentioned, but if they um, mention connections to other content in the course, comparisons, or things that they've talked about previously, that might be another important thing to make note of, because those are possible exam questions you're going to encounter, or things you might need to address in a major paper. So those kind of connections are really important. So I'm going to put up a slide called Your Turn, just wanting you to practice now this idea of taking what you just heard and writing down the main ideas that you took out of it along the left-hand side of your Cornell sheet right now, and then an overall summary at the bottom. And in this case, it's less about preparing for an exam or what your facil facilitator wants you to get out of it, and making note of the strategies or things you heard that you think are particularly useful to you, or maybe the most important things that you need to work on. So just take a couple minutes to think about everything you've heard and identify your, your personal learning style and what you feel you need to do. And once you've finished with that, I'm going to ask you to just consider whether you think this method is one you would adopt. Maybe you'd only adopt it for certain courses, not all of your courses. And then share with the group why or why not, what are aspects that you would adopt. And then again, click Submit when you're done. Again, your name's not attached to the poll response, so be honest. If it's not a method that you think works for you, that, that's okay, too. But just consider why you'd make the decision you would and what's most important for you and your learning style.
we're just going to wait for two more people to respond, and then I'll, I'll publish the results. Sorry, I was just getting messaged that there was a lot of feedback there, and then I responded to everyone. Um, I think I just had a mute button on or something, so I apologize if that made a bunch of noise for everyone. But thanks for letting me know that, John. I'll try not to use that mute button. For some reason, I guess it's causing a lot of feedback. So we're just waiting on one more response, and then I'll publish what, what folks think of, of this method and um, why they might or might not use it. Great. Looks like everyone's had a chance. So we've got some people who are going to use it and might even suggest it to others. Um, one person's mentioning that they already get handouts from their prof and just make notes on those. So it's kind of mixed reviews. Might try it. Yeah, and I'd really encourage you to, to give it a shot, maybe even just if you can commit to it for a week where you try the method, see if the summarizing helps, see if that makes you feel that you've really mastered the content in a new and different way than your old strategies, and just to see if that's something that works better for you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the idea of the prof giving handouts, because I'm going to come to that in just a minute. I also wanted to share what I felt were some of my top three things. One of them for me is, of course, just writing down the main ideas but also the idea that I should write down examples. That's another thing that I hadn't highlighted before, but I do remember from my courses that most times, whether it's an exam or a paper that I'm asked to write, it's often important to back up your statements with some kind of evidence. So whether it's a biology exam or an English paper, making note of those examples that your prof highlights is also an important thing. And Something I never practiced in the past was marking relationships between the ideas and concepts. So I would sometimes attend lectures as just isolated lectures in and of themselves and forget to make those connections to previous content throughout the term. Because the questions that you get later, especially in an exam situation, are often asking you to take all of that content and really look at it at a more critical level than just regurgitating it back. They're looking for comparisons. They're looking for inferences. So always connecting it back to other ideas that your prof mentioned throughout the course and making notes of them, maybe just in that left-hand column. And then finally, of course, finding a way to schedule in that summary time was one of the important ones for me. And of course, Cornell method isn't the only one out there. The outline method is another really common one and one that I probably used more. Um, and it can be really great for organizing ideas, especially if your lecture is presented in a really disorganized way. But I also think this is often how we receive content. A lot of our lectures now are done on PowerPoint, and they tend to be organized more in an outline format. And that's where one of the participants, you noted that, that your prof just gives you the handouts. And uh, there was a study done just in 2002, actually, of comparing performance on exams from students who would just use the prof notes versus ones that would write down their own. And that the folks that were writing down their own notes tended overall to fare a lot better in an exam situation than folks that were just using the prof notes. So that's something to make note of, that the prof notes aren't always a replacement for your own. But I noticed that our participant also did mention that they would write their own content on there as well. So maybe even using those as your own sort of Cornell method where the prof notes are the main body, but you're taking the time to highlight the key aspects and then maybe doing some summarizing in your own words at the bottom. 
that could be a strategy that works. I think the key part for me there would be the summarizing in your own words because sometimes it's easy to go over that process content again and again and think that you know it, but in, unless you can really um, say it back in your own words or teach it to another person, it's tough to have actually mastered it. Um, problem solving notes. This is kind of a takeoff on the Cornell method, but what some people propose for um, a course that's more like a math or a um, accounting, economics, that kind of course where there's a lot more problems to solve. And unfortunately, this slide maybe isn't very big, and I apologize if it's hard to see. But the idea is just that you have all of those problems and equations on one side, and then on the left-hand column is where you're writing down some of the equations or the formula that you use, or maybe explaining the theory or giving some visual diagrams. Um, my recollection of these kind of courses is that it was so tough to get the content down and the examples down fast enough, I never would have had time <laughs> to do that left-hand side, but maybe that's because uh, those courses were not my strong suit and uh, some of the math-focused content was, was harder for me. But it may have helped, actually, if I'd gone back and done that left-hand column later on to really clarify some of the content. Oh, yes, thank you, John. He's also um, noting that this example is in your student handout package. That was another of the links that we had for you to download earlier, and a lot of this content is there as well if you want to review it later. But uh, one last method that some folks have proposed is what's called mind maps. And this one, of course, is kind of a work of art. I'm sure someone didn't do that during a lecture. Um, but it's an example of a w another way to organize content which I found really interesting that for some students, this is a more helpful way to, to organize things and a chance where it's much easier to maybe create relationships between concepts and ideas and um, organize them in a new way. So that's another of the templates that I sent out um, and that John will probably add in as a link there again. Yeah, thanks, John, called the Mind Map Template. So earlier when we asked why do we organize the way we do and considering our personal learning style, there is this mind map in the background. When I first saw that, I thought that was kind of a funny idea for notes, but there are students who really successfully organize their content that way, and that's why I gave you the template. I know one student mentioned that they love that style for a psychology class, and they organize it with mind maps and, and then create arrows or patterns for content that's related. So that one might work for you too. Um, and maybe what I'll ask you to do now is just give feedback rather than polling, just give feedback now that you've seen a few other examples in the text chat area of which one of those presented do you think that you would use or have you ever tried any of the other methods? So someone else mentions that mind mapping is great for planning papers. Yeah, great point. So it's another way to create an outline but have it all in front of you. Thanks for sharing that, Cam. Or K-A-M, <laughs> I'll call you Cam for the course. So one person uses mind mapping for presentation planning like um, Prezi, which is kind of like a, a PowerPoint presentation if you're not familiar with it, but it's got some really cool um, functionality that you can organize it in a really creative way. So that's a great point. Thanks for, for pointing that out, John. That would be a great idea to use for Prezi. So someone else agrees too on mind maps for papers. Yeah, and I've never actually tried that in a lecture note situation, but I'd be interested to for some of my lectures where there's not maybe as much content and it's more of a discussion-based course, but it really allows me to get down some of what happened during that discussion. It's often easy to just focus on the conversation and forget to write anything down, and then later we don't always retain all of what went on in those discussion style courses.
So let's say you have a method that you like and that's working well for you. Um, the other thing that folks talk about, especially with the Cornell method, but I think really for anything, is how we then go about with reviewing it and what are the key strategies to think about. So that's called the 5R method, and they're listed here. We, if we start with record, I think back to the listen skills that we just talked about, coming in, having read our articles or a text in advance, or at least being prepared with what the focus of the lecture will be that day by consulting our syllabus. Um, and also making a real effort to learn your professor's cues. Um, I think sometimes we forget to do that, especially in a large lecture hall, and especially if we're in the habit of sitting far away, we might not notice those nuances where some things really do get emphasized and highlighted by a prof, or maybe there's even a particular area that they're really passionate about because it's something that they research. But it's also very likely that that's going to come up in an exam situation. So taking the time to make that connection and, and learn some of those cues from your prof is also a really good idea. Um, laptop or pen and paper. I think that, to my mind, that's something that's really a personal preference. There has actually been a few studies done on that as well. And it did find that um, in a testing situation, there really wasn't a significant difference between folks who chose to take notes on a laptop versus with pen and paper. So I think if you have a method that's working for you, either because of practical purposes or maybe you're in a course where there's lots of diagrams and you really do need to just stick to pen and paper, or, or if uh, having that laptop there is a lot easier for you, especially for writing papers later because you've got key ideas that you want to come back to and insert right into that paper or direct quote that you want to reference. That's really, I think, a personal preference. I'm not sure that one method is really necessarily more successful than another. And the pair notes that I have on your slide, I have a few question marks next to you because this is something that's been suggested for lectures where there's huge amounts of content, maybe an undergrad biology class or um, a time where you just feel like you can't even get the information down fast enough. One strategy that's proposed is to pair up with someone in your lecture and one person takes notes for half the time and the other person listens and then you reverse. And I think that's a nice idea but maybe really tough to do, especially if you don't know people in your lecture or if you don't have a similar note-taking style or you maybe lack confidence in what they'll take down versus what you would focus on. So I'll just throw it out there because it's mentioned. It's one that maybe I'm a little skeptical on and I wonder how successful it is. But feel free to interject if you've had really good experiences with something like that. I guess it's something to consider. But um, I, uh, I think that that would be a unique relationship. Um, the next p part of the 5R review is the reduce part. And this kind of comes back to that summary idea and the Cornell method because it's that theory that 80% of that material is lost unless you do review it within that 24-hour period. So really thinking through the content and especially to come up with any questions that you need to resolve either by referencing your readings or your prof or TA so that you're ready to continue in the course and have clarified any problem areas. The recite part to me relates to the listen part of the strategies we were talking about before. And that saying things out loud really does help with retention and, and also with studying. Um, a lot of times I've heard that the best way to know content is to have to teach it to someone else. And I do think that's true. So especially when it comes to exam time, reciting your content as part of your review or talking to someone about it out loud, or maybe you're just even talking out loud to yourself in your own room, um, can actually be really beneficial. So it's something to consider and to try. And there again, um, I'm going to mention the Learning Commons site for ways to get involved with study groups or to, with online tutoring or in-person tutoring if you really think that's going to be useful for you. Next part of 5R review is the reflect piece. So again, coming back to that syllabus, I think it's really easy to 
get that syllabus in the first week, find out what the assignments are, make sure you've got the readings, and then ditch it for the rest of term. And always relating the content of your course back to those learning objectives that your prof highlighted at the beginning, or what they choose to highlight as the theme for each lecture. It's a really good idea because it can help to focus that content again and think about what you are supposed to be getting out of the course. And then the relevance of it. Can you relate it to other things and to those examples? Maybe your prof's examples or maybe your own examples and making those kind of connections will help you engage with the content in a much more in-depth way. And then also, of course, thinking throughout, if it's an exam-based course, what are the questions that could be asked from this material? And that would be another thing I would encourage you to put right into the notes, maybe in that left-hand column again, is this a perfect exam question? Then write that down in the side next to that part of the content and remind yourself, okay, this is content I need to master because I'm sure there's going to be a question on that. And then, of course, the last part of the 5-hour review is to make sure that you're summarizing things within that 24-hour period, or at least by the end of the week, can you compile all those notes from the week onto one sheet of paper so that maybe each weekend you've scheduled in a bit of time to do that. And when exam time does come or those major papers are due, then maybe rather than a stack of paper to go through, you've been able to reduce it down to 13 sheets. And wouldn't that be a lot nicer than having to go through this massive amount of content? So Cam is pointing out the difference between relevance and importance. And thanks for that question. So I just want to clarify what you mean by that. Um, feel free to press the talk button too if you want to tell me a bit more what, what you mean by that. Maybe I'll go back to the last slide because that's where we talked about relevance. Um, relevance, I guess what I was getting at, is relevance in, in relation to examples that might have been given in the course for that content, or even relating it outside of the course to examples that you can bring in from your own experience, or making connections to your personal life or to your experience can help you remember the content better if you're able to relate it to those things. But sure, yes, thanks, Maria. Also, relevance just to the topic at hand for the course and its importance within the overall content and to those major learning objectives in the first place. So thanks for that. Those are good questions. And, and reflection can mean a few things. So again, that, I think it also really depends on the type of course you're talking about and whether you're preparing for for an exam or for a paper. But asking those questions along the way is an important part of your review. So is there any other questions before we continue or, or things that people want to share with the group about their own strategies for reviewing content or ways that they master the content throughout the course and during their lecture time. Please feel free to just type in there anytime. Yeah, review your, your notes with peers. I think that's really important as well. It's part of that talk part of the listen strategy or what I think of as the recite part of your review where you have someone to bounce ideas off. They might give you feedback or, or ideas about the content that you hadn't considered. But again, just saying it out loud and processing that and having to articulate your thinking can really help you solidify the content. So Maria is pointing out to to get to the main themes and connect those themes to generate our ideas. No problem, Maria. 
Thank you for sharing that. So Cam has a really good question too about a difference between taking notes from a speaker versus taking notes from reading materials. And I think that you can apply some of these strategies either way. So if you want to take more thorough notes from a text or a reading, and then again, just tease out the main concept to the side or come up with a summary. <laughs> the level of concentration can be different for sure, Maria. Absolutely. But for both of those, Cam, I would say, to my mind, one of the really important things is taking that content and putting it in your own words. I think both in a lecture situation and in a reading, um, either from an article or a text, it's really easy to find a, a great piece of content and want to just write it down verbatim. And the learning doesn't happen sometimes until we are able to say it back in our own words and with our own ideas and our own examples to really master the content. So I would say that applies both to lectures and to, to reading materials. But if anyone else has something to contribute on that front, or if there's different strategies you use for a speaker or a lecture than for your reading, reading materials, please share. I please continue to, to type away as well. I'm just going to put up the next slide anyways um, to highlight that resource I was talking about, the UBC Learning Commons. And I think John will fire in a, a, a link for us there as well in case you want to bookmark it. It's a little hard to read on this slide, maybe unless you expand it. But what I did want to show you is that uh, this is the study toolkit page of the Learning Commons, and there's all kinds of resources there. If you look at the left hand or the right hand side, sorry, on the menu, note taking is second from the bottom. There's a note taking toolkit. There's ones for exam prep, stress or time management. So there's quite a lot of great content here, as well as links to more in-depth resources if it's an area that you're really particularly interested in. There's also one on study groups and um, I've also highlighted the drop-down menu that says get study help for any sort of peer coaching or tutoring support. So this is a great site to explore if those are things you'd really like some more information on. So I'd really encourage you to click on that link that John highlighted in the text chat and bookmark it if it's something that you're interested in exploring. And I think on your student handout as well, so I highlighted a few other resources and links that students have recommended, um, other places where there's note-taking content that folks really felt was good, as well as a highlight to other workshops of this kind in case you're interested in more content just beyond note-taking itself. So I just wanted to highlight that as part of your note-taking student handout that we forwarded earlier. And maybe, John, if you wanted to send that link just one more time, that would be great in case some of our latecomers didn't manage to download the notes originally. But if you have resources that you want to share, please also share those with the group as well. And again, the most important thing here is to recognize your own learning style and what works for you. Sometimes it's easy to to head to a lecture or head to the library with friends, and, and that social time is really important too. But also just taking those few minutes to decide whether you're setting yourself up for success and if you're creating a, a space for you to summarize and review or to engage with content that really improves your own learning. So Maria is pointing out, yeah, we shouldn't forget the purpose of the note taking is to remember the lecture and retain the information. So thanks for pointing that out again, Maria. That's very true. And to, to maximize the learning during the lecture itself, it's 15 hours in your week potentially if you're having a full course load in your undergrad. And that's a lot of time and time that we can master the content during the lecture. So Anne highlighted too that Cam asked this great question about reading content versus lecture because you find that you're reading a lot more than going to the lectures. 
So thanks for pointing that out again. And and do we have other strategies that we use for notes from readings that people want to ha highlight? Maybe a tough one to answer because there are so many types of of reading for the various courses that are out there. Sometimes we've got text reading that's very straightforward where the keywords are already highlighted. Maybe there's a summary at the end. And other times we have articles that are, are really dense and are not something that we can skim very easily. So it's hard to have a, a one strategy fits all. Uh, Bagman's pointing out pre-read and then you don't have to exert yourself writing a lot. And Cam says, start from the outside of a text and work to the middle work, works for me sometimes. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I'm assuming start from the outside means maybe looking at an abstract and the conclusion, or if you're looking at a text, looking at the summary. And sometimes they have boxes highlighting the key, key points or questions. So Cam's saying, yeah. That's what she meant from outside. And I would say the same thing. I've had courses where it, it's really difficult sometimes to keep up with all the readings, but it does make a difference if at the very least I'm just looking at the major headings, the abstracts and the summaries. Maria has a comment too, how much you like the course. How many times do you need to read a history or physics book versus a novel? So thanks for pointing that out, Maria. Yeah, we all have our own personal learning style and also our, our interests and what engages us the most and get us, gets us excited about the learning. And, and recognizing those things and pursuing those passions and those interests and, and knowing that about yourself is really important. And one thing I'd highlight here that, that I mentioned before about taking that time to clarify things with the prof or the TA, I would say if there's one thing I could redo in my undergrad, it would be to have taken advantage of those office hours a little more and make that connection with the prof or TA. Because sometimes you'll find out about content in a new way or they'll they'll reframe it differently than you'd experience in the lecture. And um, it really helps you to learn the content in a new way, but also can make you just feel more invested and connected to the course when you've taken the time to personalize it and form that relationship with your teacher or, or with your TA or leader. So that's something I'd really encourage you to do if you've ever had a bit of an idea that you'd want to go do that or just come up with one or two specific questions about the course and you might be surprised at what comes out of that conversation. So Anne says, recommendations for notes from articles that we can use for writing a manuscript later. So Maria's responding to you, Anne, about highlighting the part that's important to you or the, the pieces that you want to discuss to support your work. And another thing I'd maybe highlight there is some of the great citation tools that are out there. Um, that's another thing that you'll find on the Learning Commons site or that we might all have our preferences for, but sometimes those, those ones too are a great way to organize key quotes and ideas. So um, taking investing the time to, to choose a citation tool that you really like can save you hours of time in the long run. So that would be another one I'd really encourage using. So feel free to continue um, contributing your ideas in the chat. I'm just going to put up the next slide. Um, just one last poll, just to check all the ones that apply. Just reflecting again whether that method of note taking, that Cornell method, is something you think you'll try. and do you think you can create a scheduled time to practice that review and summary process? 
and then whether you might consider visiting the Learning Commons site. So again, be honest, your name isn't attached to it and won't come up when we publish it, but just out of curiosity, after you reflect on today's workshop, what are your thoughts? So I'll just publish them in a sec. We just have one more person who's having a chance to respond, and then I'll put them up. The other thing I'll ask John to put up, we have a, a short little survey. It really is literally two minutes that we'd love some feedback on just for this style of workshop using a Wimba classroom and sharing what your experience was like. Um, so if John puts the link up, great. Thanks, John. If you wouldn't mind taking a minute to click on that and filling out the survey, it's literally just a couple minutes. And while you're doing that, I will publish these poll results. And please also continue to chat or even to use the talk button by just holding it down and talking if there's more ideas that you want to share with the group or strategies that you think are, are worth highlighting. So yeah, all of us are going to visit the Learning Commons site. That's great. I'm glad to hear that's a great resource. There is so much there. It's almost tough to navigate because there's so many resources, but it's really a, a great place to visit. You can also go in person to the Barber Center. Um, the Learning Commons is there and they often have someone at the desk who's able to help. And can, creating a scheduled time to review. Some of us are, are going to make sure we do that. And for some of us that's maybe not where it's at or really tough to do on a consistent, consistent basis. And of course the Cornell method, great for some, not necessarily for others. but hopefully just reflecting on this method and some of the others out there and on your own style will help you bring a little more intention to your note taking for the coming term and, and think about the way you organize it and what's going to work for you as you prepare for final papers or exams at the, toward the end of your term. So if anyone has more questions or other things you'd like to contribute, please chat away with the talk button or with the text chat at the bottom left. And I'm putting up a stay in touch slide. I'll, slide. I'll just type in my email in case um, something comes up later for you or you have questions. Please feel free to email me. And I'd be happy to provide resources or direct you to something you might need. So thanks for coming tonight. Um, after you've filled out the follow-up survey, the, the link that John highlighted, um, yeah, come back to us. I'll, I'll be here for a few more minutes yet if you have any more questions or things you want to comment on. If you want to comment. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I must have cut you off. One more time. You just need to press and hold down the talk button when you're speaking, otherwise we won't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know who that was that was trying to speak, but for whatever reason, I didn't hear it. So if you wanted to try just typing into the chat text at the bottom instead, I'm not quite sure why it's not working. Oh, thanks, Maria. Yeah, when you're ready to exit the classroom, um, just at the bottom right of your screen, there should be a, an area that either says exit, lobby, or help. So if you just click on exit, you should be able to exit the classroom. And thanks so much for coming today, Maria, and thanks to everyone else for your ideas and your questions, and all the best with your studies for the term. Yeah, or John points out, or you could just close your browser. That works too. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>